All right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Fabio from the AI team at Cloudwalk. Uh, as most of you know, we have this weekly meeting called the Paper Club, where we rotate uh, among the, the team members, and we each choose a paper to discuss, have kind of a seminar with the team. So today's my turn, and I chose the, the paper on NeuroProfit. Uh, NeuroProfit is a library for time series forecasting, right? Um, it was, it's still in kind of in a beta stage, uh, but it's being released uh, since last year, uh, mostly by people from Stanford University and from Facebook. Um, I kind of presented this a couple of times like uh, to you in, in, in over the last uh, couple of weeks, but super fast, but I wanted to take this opportunity to go through the paper and uh, discuss what are the, the moving parts that constitute the, the model and what we can do with it. I think it, I think it can be useful inside CloudWalk for monitoring our operations and for anomaly detection. Uh, so yeah, a good opportunity to discuss the inner workings of this, this library. Um, now the, the paper itself, it's kind of long, but it's not super complicated. So I think the, the presentation will not be, will not be very long. Uh, but I thought that maybe we could go through a, a summary of the paper uh, and later then we can stop recording and I can show some applications for the CloudWalk, for data that we get inside of CloudWalk uh, so we can have a debate on, on its usefulness. All right, so just just to get everyone started, this is, this is an example of what can be done with this library and kind of what what uh, time series forecasting is all about. This is from the tutorials, uh, tutorial notebooks that you find in, in NeuroProfit's GitHub. Uh, this curve here, it's the log of the daily page views for the Wikipedia page of Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning is a, a American football player, right? Uh, famous guy, and they, they got this data set that captures the number of visits to his Wikipedia page. Um, you see the, the black dots in here, those are the actual measured values. Uh, and you see that in this data set, they go up to the beginning of 2016. Uh, and then you see in blue uh, behind, you see the predictions made by the neural profit uh, model, right? Um, so you see that like in this period where you have the actual values, the, the predictions, they kind of match pretty closely. Like the, it, it is able to capture the, all the, the trends and seasonality effects of the of the visit to his Wikipedia page. But the, the actual cool thing is that you can extrapolate this into the future to make predictions. Uh, and you see like, it's not just a, a simple extrapolation, right? It kind of follows the, the regularity of the, the time series up to this point. Um, so I think this, the way I think this is relevant, uh, not only for forecasting time series, like predicting the future, right? Uh, predicting the, the values that will be captured in the future. Uh, but also when you have a measure of the expected values, you, you, are, you are able to identify anomalies. And that, that's what I think is the, the most useful aspect uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives here. Like being able to predict what is the expected value and then uh, capture, like have triggers to, to capture uh, when there's a large deviation. So when there's an anomaly. All right, that being said, uh, I'm gonna go through, start going through the, the paper itself, right? So this is just the, the contribution part of the paper. I highlighted some things that I think are important here. So a little bit of context. Uh, in 2017, Facebook released the original version of the Profit Library. So the Profit Library was uh, had the same idea of democratizing the access to time series prediction to forecasting, uh, but it was mostly focused on the classical method, right? So the the main points with the original Profit Library uh, were being able to capture the trends and the seasonality. Uh, the library is quite simple to use, but it's a bit, a bit restricted to those classic methods of identifying trends and seasonality. So it, it kind of, 
ignores or loses the aspect of uh, context information, right? Uh, you, you can extrapolate based on the, the weekly or the monthly and the yearly behavior, but you don't really have a consideration for the last few observations and how they affect the immediate future. Um, so yeah, the, this version we're discussing is an evolution of the original profit. Uh, so neural profit is the evolution and the, the objective here is to democratize uh, forecasting, uh, but this time making taking it uh, a step further by basically by incorporating neural networks uh, into into the model, right? So this this is why they call it a, a hybrid model. They they're using the basis with like the the classic models with trend and seasonality, uh, but there's also this layer of additional effects that are mapped using neural networks. And the the idea is that when you have neural networks on top of the classic methods, you're able to capture uh, nonlinear dynamics on how this time series evolves. Um, so the way this nonlinear dynamics are captured, like the way we move from the territory of the classic uh, methods into neural nets, is by mostly the, the components uh, that implement autoregression. So autoregression is using the values of one series to predict the continuation of that series, to predict the next steps, uh, and also using covariates. So covariates are, would be the equivalent of that, but like you, you're using instead uh, another time series that moves in parallel, right? So you're using the, the measurements from another time series to predict the one you're interested in. Um, and we'll go through the details as we talk more about the paper. Uh, another interesting point is they migrated, in this version, they migrated to a PyTorch backend. So this is uh, useful because it's more easy to extend. And uh, basically, any module you want to add uh, and that can be trained through gradient descent using standard PyTorch uh, approaches, you can just extend the the functionality of the, the library. So this is quite useful. Um, another thing that makes it very convenient is that the, the library implements uh, clever algorithms to select hyperparameters. So basically just using the standard, uh, the standard arguments to call the, the neural profit library, like it's going to run some tests in the background to determine the optimal uh, batch size, number of epochs for training, uh, the op optimal learning rate. So the standards are uh, work quite well, and there are some tests running in the background to determine the best uh, hyperparameters for your particular case. Yeah, so this is kind of the the, the contribution of this new uh, new library for time series forecasting. Now. The bulk of the paper is a presentation, is a discussion of which are the individual components that are used to, to create the, the prediction, right? So it's, you see, it's kind of a simple equation here, right? So y hat at time t, so the, the value, the predictive value at time t uh, is a sum of several uh, individual effects that are calculated uh, separately, right? Um, sorry, the, the prediction at time t is going to be uh, a trend estimated at time t, uh, the seasonal effects, the effects of events or holidays, uh, the regression for, for exogenous variables, autoregression, and regression of lagged observations of exogenous variables. So uh, it's basically just the sum of several uh, independent components, right? Uh, so I thought like the paper goes through each of them and I w wanted to, to give a summary of each of those uh, components in here. So I'll just go through and through them in the order that appear in the paper, right? Um, okay, so the, the first uh, aspect here would be the trend, right? So uh, the model is capturing uh, a trend uh, lasting for the entire time series, right? So how how this would be done classically, right? So basically the trend at time T1 was, would be the, ten, the trend at time T0 uh, plus 
a constant times the the delta between those two in, those two instants, right? So it's basically just a linear uh, a linear uh, curve here. Uh, so the the result of this equation would be uh, a line that is continuous that, that is linear, continuous, and kind of zigzags up and down uh, according to what they call the change point. Um, so this curve here in, in the bottom, this is relative to that Peyton Manning uh, model, right? to, to the Peyton Manning time series. So this is what's happening. It, it identified like this, this linear trend that changed uh, at a certain number of change points. Um, the, the inclination here, the slope of those lines is learned by the model and the selection of the change points is also learned it's optimized by the model and then when you're doing predictions for the future you just extrapolate the last uh, the value of the last trend right so yeah this is the the trend is basically a kind of a rough uh, captures roughly the the shape of the of the curve uh, in the long run and this this is part of what would be called the, the classical approach, right? So this, this was present in the original profit already. All right, next uh, is the seasonal effect. So this would also, this was also present in the original library and this would be considered kind of part of the classic approach. Uh, but basically what it's doing is it's identifying like some, some, reasonable periods to consider so like uh daily seasonality makes total sense right so it's a it captures the daily seasonality captures the weekly seasonality if it's present in the time series captures the yearly seasonality too um and then basically for each of those different uh time lengths for, for each of those periods it's going to fit a Fourier uh expansion of the of the observed value. So there's this classic uh, signal processing technique for identifying the, the seasonality, like the regular uh, behavior across uh, a certain time period. It, you can, when you're using the library, you can choose the number of uh, terms in the Fourier expansion, uh, but the standard term, like the standard number of, of terms actually works pretty well. So it's, it's super easy to use and you don't need to modify uh, stuff other than the, the original, like the, the default argument. Uh, an interesting thing here, like you, by default, by default, these effects, they're considered to be addictive, right? Uh, so you just add a value here uh, all along your time series, but you also have an option to, to do this, uh, to multiply the trend. So this term here s uh, instead of being a standalone term it would be like s times the trend uh, in this kind of you notice this effect on the the predicted time series like some if you use the additive additive uh, seasonal effect sometimes you may get uh, negative predictions for for things that are uh, that should be uh, natural numbers uh, so Choosing to to use the seasonal effects as a multiplicative effect uh, usually makes more sense from from the test I ran. All right, so next um, these are the autoregression effects. So this I think it's the the most important aspect that makes the this library perform way better than its successor. So this is like the the cool part of the the library. This is the extension. Um, so autoregression means that you're using a series to pre like the, the past values of a series to predict the future values, right? Uh, so you're regressing a, a, a variable over itself. You're using it to predict its future values. Um, classically, the way this would be done is kind of a, a just a linear regression, right? So the the value at time t would be modeled as a constant plus a linear combination of the values that are right before time t, right? So 
uh, a linear combination of the last p values uh, plus just a narrower term. But yeah, this this equation here would represent the simplest way of doing a, a auto regression, right? Just a, a linear regression of the last values. Now, NeuroProfit does this in a bit more of a sophisticated way. Uh, so what the equation is showing here, like this, it is using the last p values of the variable y, and it's feeding those last p values into the autoregression net. So just a, it's a neural network uh, that produces h forecast into the future. So the difference here is that we have, like, we do have as inputs uh, several values from the past uh, at each point, uh, but we have as outputs also many values into the future. And like this, this P and this H uh, numbers are, are parameters that you can choose. But the idea is that by using P uh, values in the past, you would be able to predict H values in the future. So this is what the, the neural net is doing. I think this, this has some interesting implications on, on the types of forecasts that we have. Like, and this is, I just sketched this uh, just to just to show a point, like just to show how this is how this works over time. But basically, what's happening is a moving window, right? So if you take here on September 22, um, if we're taking like the, the 14 previous days to make a prediction for the seven next days, right? So we will be taking this 14 days here in blue. Uh, we would be feeding those values into the neural network and the outputs of the neural network would be seven values in the future. So that's the type of prediction you would be doing. And so like, in September 22, you would be using like the, the values for September 22 and taking 14 values from the past, and then you're predicting September 23 and like seven values in the future. Uh, now, this is a, these are moving windows, right? So at each day, you're taking the last 14 uh, values and you're predicting the seven next values. Now, I think the interesting thing here is that the consequence of predicting several values in the future is that for each day, you have like several predictions for that same day. And at each step, the prediction is going to be using um, values of a certain age, right? So if you take, for example, here, October 1st, the first day where we'll have a, a prediction for October 1st is actually going to be September 24. So in September 24, we will be predicting seven days into the future, and the last one of those will be October 1st. So you will be making predictions with data that is like one week old, basically. Uh, but then in the next day, October 1st is also going to appear, and then in the next one, so like if you're predicting seven, seven values in the future, then each day is actually going to have seven independent predictions, right? Uh, and it, the October 1st is going to have a prediction for all of these uh, dates in here. Now, I think this is interesting because since you have several predictions for the same day, then you can start uh, making statistics, right? Um, and you can use the differences between those predictions as estimates of the uncertainty about uh, what's going to happen in October 1st, right? Um, so when we use this data, we can start thinking about ranges that can be expected for this, uh, this, this value of this time series in each particular date, right? So this is one point, like we can consider doing statistics on the several different predictions for the same day. But we can also choose to ignore some of those predictions, right? So if you take, for example, this last one here. Um, so this is the prediction in September 30. And we're predicting the next day, which is October 1st. Uh, now, if we're suppose we're using this for anomaly detection, right? And we have an anomaly in September 30. Uh, because this value would be anomalous, I think like this would still have an influence in the prediction of October 1st. So if you use the prediction with data that is very current, like you use the prediction considering data from the previous day, then your prediction might be affected by the anomaly, right? 
Um, so in a way, it, it, it could be, if you're using these predictions to detect anomalies, it could be better to, for instance, throw away this prediction with very recent data because this prediction could be tainted by an anomaly uh, in the previous day. So like this, there's this choice of what you're going to do with uh, all of these uh, predictions in parallel. Like, are you doing statistics? Are you using all of them? Uh, are you giving a, a larger weight to the ones that are more recent? So there's decisions here and there's opportunity for exploration into how to use all of those multiple predictions. All right, so um, still about the autoregression, right? The, the important thing is that autoregression provides local context. So it's not only looking at the long-term, uh, the trend, the long-term trend in seasonality, but also it's actually uh, doing predictions based on the most uh, recent observation, right? Um, so this is the, the, the thing that mostly contributes to, to improved performance, right? It's very sensitive to, to the kind of the last few days or the last few samples of observation. You have also options here, right? By default, if you choose to use the, the autoregression, it's going to default to zero hidden layers, which just corresponds to the, to the linear regression, right? So this is very uh, convenient for explainability. But then if you want to use a deeper network for capturing no, the non-linearities, that's also super easy. Um, also, another important thing is that you have access to, to L1 regularization and like, there's also a parameter for how much you are going to force input sparsity. Um, and this is important because like, if you're offering a long, uh, large number of lags, like if you're, if you're training the network to use several of the past uh, values to predict the future, those values are probably extremely correlated, right? So we know that uh, strong correlations between input variables in neural networks, that's not very good for the quality of your predictions. Um, then if you, if you use a one regularization, there's a tendency to zero out some of those, some of the weights for the, for the input, so this kind of sparsifies the your input, right? Um, and I think this this is interesting because it kind of allows it kind of corresponds to to things that we do kind of intuitively. Uh, it's very common to make predictions for some of our time series by taking an average of uh, the value observed uh, at the same time one week ago and also the value observed one month ago. Uh, so when we're like taking averages of those past values at strategic intervals, that's kind of what we're doing, right? Um, we are doing a sort of autoregression by doing a linear combination of past values uh, in strategic points that we think uh, correlate very strongly to the to the next observation. So yeah, this is something that is supported by the library and it's going to be done in a statistically uh, sound uh, manner, right? It's going to be trained to look at the, which are the best uh, values, like which are the best inputs in the past to be using for prediction in the future. All right, so there's also the option for lagged observations of other variables. So this is kind of corresponded to the auto regression, but it's not auto anymore. Now you're using a, a separate time series. Um, and like uh, a simple example to explain this would be if you're using, like if you're trying to predict the temp the temperature, the time series of the temperature, uh, auto regression would be using the past values of the temperature. Um, and at the same time, the, this lagged uh, regression of exogenous variables would be using a, a separate time series like the precipitation. Like if you have access to the precipitation time series, this could be very helpful uh, also in predicting the temperature because there's, there's obviously a very strong correlation between the two things. So what's going on here is just basically the same thing, right? You're taking the, the previous values of this other time series and you're passing them through a neural network to predict how they influence the time series that uh, you're interested in. 
the future regressors here, it, it's a similar thing, but uh, when you're using future regressors, you're not only having access to the, to the past values, but also to the future ones. Uh, this can sound a bit counterintuitive, but actually what's going on is that like you, you might have access if you're trying to predict the temperature, you might have access to the weather forecast in the next few days. Uh, so you can use the, the forecast for like the next one week to predict the next one week of actual temperatures, right? So this these three factors in here the, are, are very similar to each other, right? So uh, it's whether you're using like the, the, the time series itself or another correlated time series, or a time series that contains future data, which would be mostly predictions and stuff like this. And lastly, there's the effect of events in holidays. So this is useful also. Um, you have like events and, and national holidays that are going to influence some of the time series you might be interested in predicting. Um, so you can basically just inform the library which are your uh, events of interest uh, and it's going to use the historical data to to learn the effects of those events um, and also it's going to use the, the the events in the future to adjust the the prediction accordingly um, so the events they're, they're going to they're going to be mapped as binary variables so either they happen or they don't uh, in a particular date uh, and they're going to be very similar to the future regressors, right? Um, there's also an option where you can uh, configure uh, a certain time period around an event. So you could model, like, if you inform the library about the date of Christmas, you can also ask it to, to uh, model uh, the, the Christmas Eve, like, uh, because the shopping patterns would be different uh, in the day before the, the actual holiday. And like here, I added a couple of charts. These are also relative to the Peyton Manning case. Uh, so in here, the, they were demonstrating how to use the effects, and they actually modeled uh, the date, including the dates of the playoff games um, and uh, the date of the Super Bowl, which would be obviously uh, uh, dates of interest where people would uh, look through the, the Wikipedia page of this football player more often, right? Um, so you see the actual effects in here. Uh, so you see when these events happened uh, and what is the effect that is being considered, like that is being added to the predicted time series. And you see here also like the, how it calculated the, the weight uh, of each of those two effects. All right, so a couple more interesting features. Um, if you have missing data, the library will just do imputation by itself. Like, in, depending on the number of consecutive uh, missing data points, it's either going to interpolate between the, the neighbors or it's going to use a, a rolling average to interpolate. Uh, so, if you, for missing a couple of the of the observations, that is not uh, not a problem. The library will take care of this. Um, it also automatically normalizes the data. So by default, it's going to, to use zero for the lowest value and one for the 95th percentile. So your values are going to actually be between zero and one point something. Um, so this is super convenient. You don't need to normalize your data. Even if you're using several uh, different time series in parallel, it's going to normalize everything. Uh, so it's super easy to just feed it a, a data frame and, and all of the pre-processing will be taken care of by the library. Uh, there's also this automatic estimates for the learning rate, the batch size, and the training epoch. So kind of if you're just using the, re the, the full parameters, everything looks very well because there are uh, tests that it performs before fitting the, the curve. Uh, kind of, very well grounded, well established to determine those type of parameters. Um, and a very cool thing also is that you can use a global model. So you can feed the, the library with several time series in parallel, and it, it's going to create this global model that will make predictions for all of them at the same time. So this is super useful. 
uh, and could be something that interests us in, in doing applications in the future. Right, so this was a link to the Payton Many uh, demonstration, but they kind of showed some of the curves already, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, next, there's there's the experiments, but like regarding the model itself, do you guys have any question, anything you'd like to, to answer before we go into the experiments? All right. Um, there's no question, just talk a bit about the experiments. Um, so in the experiments portion of the paper, they, they just compared the neural profit with the successor, with profit itself. So it's not like, it's not, they didn't do comparisons with other I mean, state of the art, uh, time series forecasting libraries or, or algorithms or anything. So it's just a comparison with the successor. Uh, and they used two types of data sets. So the first one was they created a few synthetic data sets. Um, and for the creation of each of them, they kind of used the same equation that the model uses. So like there were data sets that had all of the, those different components. There were data sets that they created only with the trend and seasonality. So different combinations of the, the components. Uh, so like, I'm not even going to dignify this portion of the test with lots of comments because like obviously neural profit perform better than the original version because it either has the same components. Uh, so in, for those same components, it would just perform the same. Uh, but in data sets that included the other components that profit didn't look at, obviously neural profit perform better. But also they, they ran a few tests with uh, several public uh, time series data sets. So they got it from Kaggle and from Stanford University. So from a couple of repositories of, of data sets with always with univariate time series. Uh, they did no hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and then for, for the performance comparison, they did what they call the expanding origin back test which I thought was interesting, like the way they split the data across time. And I wanted to talk a little about this. Um, so yeah, th this is what they call the expanding origin back test, right? So it's basically two for loops, right? Um, the outer loop is what they call this k-fold expanding origin back test. So they did like the k-fold was, the k was five. So the outer loop were those five folds in here. So basically what they did is they had five different versions of the, the data set where the test set was always 10% of the total data and the training set were the, the previous, uh, the, the past data before the, the test set. So in the first fold, I think there, like the training set was 70% of the data and the test set was the subsequent 10%. Then in the next fold, uh, they took like a 5% of data uh, step uh, forward, right? So in the second fold, there's actually an overlap of 50% of those two uh, test sets. So they just took a step forward. Uh, test set is still the same size, 10% of the data, uh, but there was an actual increase in 5% in the training set. So they did this subsequently until covering the entire time series. So at each step, the test set shared 50% of the data with the previous one. So that is the outer loop. Now the inner loop, like, like for each run of the outer loop, so for each of those five folds, there would train the entire model in the training set. So just one training run for the, for the training set. Um, and then the inner loop was taking forward steps here, uh, like one observation at a time. Uh, until they they made like made the the predictions for the entire test set um, without retraining anything. So for each of those five folds here is just one model training, uh, and then they moved one day at a time in the in the test set making the the predictions. So yeah, I think this this is an interesting way of splitting the time data and like because we we do lots of. We train models that have this time component. This would be an interesting way to split our data for, for all the models that we train. 
All right, so I wanted to show a couple of the results in here. So um, they are using here the 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 metric. Uh, it's actually normalized, so uh, it's always divided by the last observation. So the the consequence of this is that when the error is one, uh, this matches the naive prediction of just repeating the last the last value. So it's a good a good thing to have in mind like any error that is below one means that you're better than the naive method which would be just predicting the the less value now one thing that is interesting here like in the the standard uh, in the default models without the auto regression just the trend and seasonality both the old uh, library and the new one they perform way worse than just predicting the less value so this is this is a demonstration of how important it is to use local context, right? Um, you might do some super sophisticated mathematics to, to capture the trend and the seasonality and like how it changes during the day, during the week. Uh, but even so, if you're just, just repeating the less, uh, the less value as the next day's prediction, is still better than all of this sophisticated uh, uh, modeling if you don't use the local context. Um, but then you see when they started using like configuring neural profit to use the neural network uh, with different number of legs. So this will be the number of observations in the past. Uh, then results start to really get uh, better than the than the naive method, right? Um, so the number of legs this refers to the number of past observations you're using, right? Uh, and here on like on the horizontal axis, you see the number of steps forward that you're trying to predict. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a very clear uh, information here that like using a larger number of legs, using a larger number of past values, actually tends to to increase your ability to predict the the future steps. They also did this ablation study where they varied the number of, like, they varied the, the configuration of the neural network uh, used for autoregression. Um, so in here you see, like, for 30 legs, uh, they used this different configuration. So one hidden layer with 32 units, two hidden layers with 24, four hidden layers with 16. Um, and I think the interesting portion here is like the interesting conclusion is if, for instance, you're using 30 legs to predict uh, three steps in the future, then the actual configuration of the neural network doesn't affect the result all that much. Um, so the, the results are kind of all in the same ballpark here. So I think this, this shows that um, the performance as long as you're using the neural network and you're using these legs to predict the future like the actual configuration of the neural network doesn't matter all that much uh, it's pretty robust to non-optimal hyperparameters so this is pretty uh, it's pretty neat yeah so that that's all i had for the paper like uh if you guys have any questions we can talk about it or, or i can just show some results like i ran this for a couple configurations of our own internal data we can uh, go through them and take a look